Kate is an assistant professor at the Department of Plant Sciences in the College of Agriculture and Bioresources at the U of S. And she is a polymath. Um, she did training at Queen's University um, as well as the University of Guelph. And so she knows lots of stuff about biology and chemistry and land resource science. And so we're just thrilled to have her here to bring this, this cocktail of knowledge and expertise and, and research in the field to share with us. Um, and her talk is titled Balancing Acts for a Sustainable Food Future. And Kate, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I, I have to say it would have been absolutely lovely to be in Winston's right now having a beer with you all um, instead of being in my office at 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. So this is just a virtual background, but it yeah, will make do with what we have. Uh, so thankful that we can at least connect with through this platform here. And uh, many thanks to Julia, Jackie, Logan, and, and the 5x5 team here. Um, just before we get started, if, just to the audience, if you don't mind, it would be really great if you could just turn your cameras on for just one quick second so I could see who's out there and I'm not actually speaking into a void and there's people behind my computer somewhere. Hi, everyone. Oh, this is lovely. Oh, it's nice to see some familiar faces. Thank you for indulging me there. Um, yeah, it's nice to see familiar faces. And for those of you who, who I don't know, my name is Kate Congreves. I'm a, I'm a foodie, I'm a gardener, and I'm also an agricultural researcher. Um, and today I'm gonna talk about food. Um, and food is just such a fantastic topic to think about and to discuss. And in preparing for this talk, I was contemplating, what is it about food that draws us in? You know, our obsession with cooking shows and cooking books and new places to eat, you know, I was just kind of thinking, but what, what is it about food that it creates this obsession for us? And I don't know, it might be, it might be one of the closest things that we actually have to, to a common language, um, almost a universal language. It's, it's a uniter. We literally gather around tables and eat together. Uh, and through food, we share cultures and we trade recipes and we learn new techniques. We learn about different plants and, and how to use them. So uh, it's just such a fascinating topic uh, and it has a thread through all, all of our daily activities in our, in our lives. Also, food is very complex. It is central to one of the biggest challenges that we're facing today. Um, and, and that's the need to produce enough food, produce enough food, um, enough nutritious food, produce it in a way that's sustainable and distributing it equitably. And so to provide some context, um, oh, I should just, Logan, is, uh, is my screen sharing happening at all? Oh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so to provide some context to that, the global population has indeed quadrupled in size over the span of a single century. And this phenomenon has been largely sustained by the intensification of food production. You know, as the population has grown, so too has the land space under crop cultivation. So we actually have over half of all the cultivated land produces staple grains, which we need, things like corn, wheat, soybean, and rice. It's over 1.7 billion acres devoted to producing those staple grains. So on one hand, we, humanity globally, have, have done quite well. We've increased food production to such an extent that we've supported this, you know, dramatic increase in, in population growth. But, you know, there is a little bit of which came first, the chicken or the egg, but regardless, you know, the point is that, you know, we're sustained by food production. They we, we very much connected and go hand in hand. But meeting the demand for food will be far more difficult in the coming decades for several reasons. We have multiple crises that are converging and creating unprecedented urgency for sustainable and healthy food production and, and access. And these crises include things like climate change. And you can, Logan, you can change the slide. So climate change, of course, you're, you're aware it's, it's destabilizing many of the natural processes that really make large scale food production possible. We also have this convergence with other crises at the same time. You know, next slide, the, there is a growing mix match between 
nutritional requirements and the, like the type of food that we need and the type of food that is largely dominantly produced. So humans actually need really nutrient dense fruits and vegetables to the point where Canada's new food guide is recommending half the plate. So you think about what you had for dinner. Did you have half the plate fruits and vegetables? Uh, and, and, you know, that's a bit of a mismatch with, you know, the, the food production industry and, and system as a whole. So that's a, that's an issue on its own. You know, most of, uh, most of food production is actually producing really carbohydrate rich materials as opposed to fruit and vegetables, um, where we actually have an under, uh, an, an under production of fruit and vegetables globally to feed the current population, let alone any, any further growth. And next slide, we also have another issue where there is at the same time a widening gap between those who are food secure and those who are food insecure and this is inequity issues there's systemic barriers that block access to healthy food for all next slide this is not a crisis but it's a it's a fundamental change that's happening in, in the midst of all these other things right so this the, what we're seeing here is a, a growing rural to urban migration to the point where by 2050, 70% of the human population, and there'll be 10 billion of us by then, 70% of the human population by, by 2050 will live in urban areas, in cities. And so meeting this complex demand for the future of foods that is indeed gonna be complex for all of these reasons. And so the future of food might have to look very different than it has, than it has for the past century. And so for this talk today, really, I'm just presenting some food for thought, some, or in other words, just thought exercise focused on how food might be more resilient, considering these um, issues on the horizon that are currently facing us. And so for this talk, I'd like to talk about uh, horticulture. Um, so next slide. And, and, and that's because horticulture actually does, it has immense potential to shape the future of food. And uh, it's also um, the inspiration for this talk was, you know, as Jackie mentioned, that um, we have the International Year of Fruits and Vegetables this year. And it also coincides with uh, another celebration that we're at, from the University of Saskatchewan, where we have 100 years of horticulture science at the University of Saskatchewan. So, you know, these few things have were the inspiration for this talk primarily food for, food for thought. Now, what is horticulture? Just as a quick reminder, in, in next slide here, horticulture is it's the science and the art of the development, the sustainable production, the marketing and use of really high value, intensely cultivated food and ornamentals. And classically, the divisions of horticulture include things like, well, we've got fruits and vegetables, and ornamentals. So that would be floriculture and landscaping. So those are the classic divisions of horticulture. And to understand how horticulture, and specifically urban horticulture, I just want to touch on urban horticulture quite a bit here. So these, these things, but in an urban setting. So how urban horticulture can play a role in the future of food. I want to begin by just diving into history a little bit. Because we can actually learn, we, we can learn a lot from the past. The historical and archaeological record offers, you know, crucial insights into urban food systems. Actually, helps us answer questions like, well, how did people in cities of the past build food security, and how did people in cities of the past cope with cuts in supply lines and crises? And so, Swedish scientists did a really interesting study a few years back and, and they looked at these very questions and it was really impactful to me when, when I read about it. So I want to share their story with you. I find it fascinating. So they explored food security and food resilience by looking at two very distinct and unrelated historical metropolitan landscapes. So next slide. So they looked at pre-Columbian Mayan cities and also medieval Constantinople. And they found remarkable similarities in these enduring cities, uh, which offered really important insights to help us understand food security and actually offer some potential clues about the future of food. So 
when they looked at first Mayan civilizations, so that we're looking at, you know, the Yucatan Peninsula, Southeast Mexico, Guatemala, Belize area. And this region had a complex series of cycles of growth, decline, reorganization, growth, decline, reorganization. And numerous cities emerged uh, in, in numerous cities, you know, around a, a thousand years BC. And these cities had a really long longevity. They were in existence for more than a thousand years. So demonstrating remarkable food resiliency. And so what is it about these cities and, and their ability to confer food resiliency that, that created that? And so the first question here is, well, what did those cities look like? And most Mayan cities actually shared a basic model for how to organize urban landscapes. So the next slide there, I, I show you how, they are, how they're organized. So the center of cities was a core area, and that was for civic and ceremonial purposes. So think of it like town hall, and it was surrounded by urban sprawl. So the urban sprawl was residential household groups that clustered into various neighborhoods. And each neighborhood was kind of centered around their own mini core, a subsidiary civic core. And so plenty of scholars and researchers have wondered why were the cities organized and dispersed like this? And there's all sorts of proposed explanations. But the one overriding explanation, and, and the one that's most agreed upon here, is that these, these cities actually had large urban spaces that were devoted to horticulture within the city. And so the clustering that you're seeing here is actually a grouping of households and garden space, collectively forming farmsteads all within the city. So a series of farmsteads scattered throughout. And in the process of expanding the urban landscape and expanding the city, the sprawl actually produced what was called, what we, what we think of as green cities or garden cities or forest gardens or agro-urban landscapes. So there are two really key reasons for, for why, why this arrangement conferred food resiliency. Why was it that this particular arrangement enabled cities to survive a really long time, uh, thousands of years, and, and continually reorganize and rebuild during times of crises? And the first reason is that this arrangement enabled diversity of food all throughout these urban spaces. And there's actually a term for this. It's been called managed mosaic. I just love that term. It, it was a managed mosaic. It gives a really nice visual for the diversity and, and the complex spatial distribution of the food resources. You can just picture it. It's a mosaic of garden agriculture, of orchard farming, of fruit trees, cultivation, agroforestry. And interestingly, it was how the variety of sources of sustenance, how the variety of sources of food were balanced differently from place to place and how that balance changed time and time again according to environmental, economic, and socio-political changes and conditions. But it was the balance that was really important in driving that food security, um, more important, in fact, than just simply ad adapting to the environment alone. Now, I, I said there were two key reasons for this spatial arrangement conferred food resiliency. One was diversity, and the other one is, is that the spatial patterning itself actually provided several key ecosystem services. So this basic uh, unit of growth, which is the, the building block there, which is the, the urban farm set, the household and the, the garden space, that actually provided key ecosystem services beyond just food provision. So of course, you know, you could grow food and collect and harvest fruits and vegetables, et cetera, and grains. Uh, but it also did other things directly inside the city. So it provided supporting and regulating, regulating services. So think of efficient, you know, waste recycling, vision nutrient cycling, water filtration, et cetera. So in Mayan cities, there were indeed large swaths of land outside the city that uh, was devoted for food production. And that was mainly uh, controlled by the ruling class and it was for taxation purposes. So that did exist. But when economic conditions and socio-political conditions caused their collapse, the city continued to survive time and time again because of the urban horticultural um, system infrastructure that they have in place. 
And so it gave the, the city the ability and the resiliency to reorganize. Now, another very different city is Constantinople. And I don't have a slide for this one, um, but it, it demonstrates remarkable resiliency as well. So this city, uh, completely different side of the earth, and, and that city uh, carried, out, carried on through numerous periods of crises and millennia as well. And one of the explanations um, for it being in existence for over a millennia uh, is its blue-green infrastructure. It's kind of similar to that managed mosaic, it's that blue-green infrastructure. And what that means is that it wasn't just a garden city, but it was a water city. So there was actually a combination of local food production and storage, as well as water storage. All infrastructure built directly into that city. Now, this city was very different from the mine cities in key ways. Um, this city actually relied on imports. Uh, they didn't produce a lot of the grain themselves. They, they imported it from key partners in neighboring air regions. And they accumulated a lot of it to the point that it was stored in the city, accumulated to the point where bread was actually free for everyone at one point. Um, but it was when the, the supply lines were cut that household gardens began to represent the significant extent of food production and consumption. So there are various sieges and conflicts and blockades that kind of blocked the city and you couldn't enter or exit for almost a decade in some cases. Uh, and and, and in, in those periods of crises, that city relied heavily on investing in water infrastructure as well as space for urban horticulture. And it's this city where you have lots of written records and agronomic texts that start to be produced. There's actually manuals that are produced that were titled translation, but the, the title of these manuals were how to produce food inside a city. And so all sorts of written uh, texts that kind of created that social ecological memory that was necessary for food resiliency time and time again, over a thousand years. Now, those two examples are of the really, really distant past. I just find it so fascinating just to think about what we can learn from them. Um, but of course, times were different and they were very distant past. But uh, there are also more recent historical examples that demonstrate the importance of horticulture during times of crises. And so you can think of the victory gardens of World War I and World War II, and also the relief gardens of the Great Depression. And today, anecdotally, our interest and obsession with gardening has seemingly increased during COVID as well. So it appears that time and time again, horticulture helps, helps make us resilient and pulls us through some crises. So next slide. Now earlier, I did mention ecosystems earlier, and I, I wanna spend a bit more time on that here because this concept is so important that it does deserve more attention. So you might be wondering first, what are ecosystem services? I kind of glossed over it, but what, what are they? And the short answer here is that ecosystem services are, they're, it's essentially our life support system. Our lives depend on them. We need food, we need water, we need air, all of which are either provided by, supported or regulated by the ecosystems that we live in. And so it's these ecosystem services that make life on earth possible not just humans, but other life on Earth as well. And so they're usually categorized into four different types of ecosystem services. We have provisioning, regulating, supporting, and cultural services. And interestingly, urban horticulture has a crucial role in all four. So next slide. For provisioning services, well, clearly urban horticulture, in, in terms of urban food and fruit and vegetable production, well, clearly it provides food. So that's a provisioning service, right? But exactly how much potential does this have? I mean, we're talking urban horticulture here. How much potential does this really have? How much food can be produced inside cities? And so researchers recently, you know, are starting to measure this more and more, starting to quantify this. We've seen some really interesting papers coming out, uh, especially out of, out of Europe these days, quantifying this. So they've actually, researchers have gone out and measured things like vegetable crop yields, all from urban gardens or urban producing areas within a city, and accumulate, find what, find what that total is, add it all up, and they were actually quantifying it. 
And they're finding that the total yields are in fact comparable to those produced from the conventional farms. And so each garden may be really low acreage itself, but city-wide, that actually adds up and the, and the production itself can be rather astounding. So horticulture and gardening can be highly productive. Now, one recent study uh, loved its title. It's called The Hidden Potential of Urban, Urban Horticulture. Because um, it's something that usually we walk by and we don't pay attention to on our, on our walks about town. The Hidden Potential of Urban Horticulture. And it's published in Nature and, and it's absolutely fascinating. So they used GIS to analyze the space inside of a city that is available or could be made available for horticultural production. So things like allotment gardens, community gardens, domestic gardens, or just wider uh, green space that could be edible landscapes. And they also looked at flat rooftop, uh, flat rooftops that um, would withstand, that could be converted into controlled environment horticulture and, and actually even operate year round. And so adding up all that space, what they found was that in theory, there's more than enough space there to actually provide an entire city with their fruit and vegetable needs and, and, and meet their nutritional needs. So really, a, a, a really astounding uh, results that are coming and no wonder they got published in, in nature. So, but also a little bit, you know, actually doing that is entirely another thing, like actually doing that is, is something else entirely. But in theory, if cities were intentionally designed, to include urban food production, it would help with this city's food security. And a little bit reminiscent of how Mayans designed their cities. Eh? Now, also if it could be done, it might help remedy that mismatch between you know, the food that we need and, and the food that's available and uh, address the issue of under underproduction of food and vegetables to meet the demand, for the current demand and future demand. Uh, next slide. Oh, I missed that one. One more. Yeah, another, the next one. Yeah. So what about these other services? So we have provisioning services, so providing food, and we kind of just talked about that. So how urban horticulture could provide, you know, decent amounts of food. But there are other ecosystem services, right? The supporting and the regulating services. And these services are actually less obvious to our eyes. It's mostly out of sight. You might walk right past them and not even realize. So an example would be something like nutrient cycling. So in every garden bed that you walk past on your, you know, running your errands in town, every garden bed that you walk past, there's actually a lot going on in there. Together with the plants, the soil, and the microbes and the fungi, they're all in concert and they're working on cycling nutrients. And so for example, in nutrients in the soil and any of those garden beds are actually being taken up by plants and microbes. And then once the plants and microbes die, their biomass goes back into the soil and the decomposers get to work again. So this is the nutrient cycle and, and this nutrient cycle gives life. Um, and, and if it's tightly cycled nutrients, which we don't, we're not looking at, where we don't have excess amount of nutrients, um, that's, that's fairly key to actually mitigating environmental concerns about nutrient runoff in cities and, and pollution. Next slide. Now, another service that you know you might walk past and not, not think about is water cycling. So anywhere there's garden beds, whether it's floriculture, landscape tree areas, or food gardens, the plants and the soil together are helping with the water cycle. They're soaking up water, they're enabling infiltration and water storage. And so, you know, take a look at that photo and you can you can really see that. And, and then compare that in your mind to asphalt or pavement covered in a city where this service isn't happening. And so pavement is impermeable, prone to flash flooding events, and that's gonna cause problems. So it does cause problems for the city, right? And if you can think of urban horticulture in the context of looking up and looking on the green roofs, uh, green roofs can actually help to mitigate uh, flooding issues as well by capturing water and trapping it before it even runs down to the pavement where we're walking on the streets. So another next slide, urban green spaces actually also help regulate the city's kind of heat dynamics. So 
it actually helps keep the city from overheating in the summer. So all that green vegetation helps to reflect more heat and compare that to black asphalt and dark surfaces that absorb and retain heat. And so urban horticulture actually offers a service of heat mitigation and heat regulation. Next slide. Pollination services. So we're looking at, you know, urban gardens or floriculture or food gardens, lots of flowers that should help helping to attract all sorts of pollinators, bolstering species richness, and just diversity in general, whether it's insect diversity or plant diversity. And, you know, that's going to benefit the surrounding area and also um, further support any cross pollinating fruit and vegetable crops that might be also grown within the city. So having a nice healthy insect bank there available to provide that service is a uh, is it would be a good thing for for the yields within the within the city. And this is actually attributed to one of the main proposed reasons for why yields might be so good within cities when we're looking at fruit and vegetable crops. You know, in that earlier study, they, when they found really high yields, they were thinking this actually might have to do with pollination services. Next slide. Again, it may, it may seem insignificant when you're walking about town, but that green space all around you and in the, in the areas where you, where you can see it, they're actually also climate regulators. And so plants and trees are all part of the biosphere and they take up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they, uh, that carbon is, is uh, sequestered into the plants through the process of photosynthesis. So it's taken up by the plants through, through the process of photosynthesis. And the plants can move that carbon into the soil, either in the form of their tissues when, when, they, date, when they die and senesce and get returned to the soil and decompose themselves. Or they can also move that carbon into the soil through their root systems and their root exudates. And of course, there are other regulating services. I've only picked a few here, but there are others like recycling wastes. Uh, and, you know, and again, that would be decomposition, really an unsung hero here. It's such an important service that we we take for granted. On the downside, I do want to mention it's really important that growing food in cities can, can be a risk if the food is grown in contaminated soil or compost is polluted. And so that is definitely a concern to consider. It, you know, we don't have rose-colored glasses on right now. We, we do need to be uh, aware that there are risks if, there, if food is being grown in contaminated areas. So that, that is a concern. The other thing here is that you know, due to just general anthropogenic disturbances in cities, like cities are, are quite disturbed and, and soil under cities are, are quite disturbed. And so they've actually been long considered, you know, urban soils have been long considered to actually be poor at these supporting and regulating services. You know, in theory, they should do all these things that we did, I just walked through, but you know, if, there, if the soils are actually so disturbed in cities, well, they're probably going to be quite poor at regulating and, and, and supporting services. But I love how research challenges us to rethink some of these assumptions. And so some recent work is coming out that's disputing this assumption and saying that urban soils can indeed, they've measured it in several cities, that urban soils, especially urban horticultural soils, can indeed be highly fertile and they can contain more carbon than non-urban soils. And some of the carbon contents, uh, you know, these papers have been published in science because the, the assumption is so striking is that the carbon contents in, the, in urban soils can be three to five times higher than natural soil. Urban gardens can have equal or even better measures of biological quality, soil quality. So biological activity and diversity um, has also been found to be you know, as good or, or better than, than non-urban soils. So some of these older assumptions do need to be checked. You know, urban gardens and soil in urban gardens and urban horticulture do not always have a compromised ability to carry out provisioning, regulating, and, and supporting services. So really interesting picture starting to emerge, right? And you know, if you think about it a bit, bit longer, it actually isn't all that surprising because, you know, I know a lot of gardeners, and I'm sure you folks know a lot of gardeners as well. They take care of their soil. They're adding compost, they're adding mulch, that's carbon, right? And, and think about what their gardens look like. They're, there's lots of green cover. Sometimes there's, they, they extend their growing season. Um, you've got lots of living roots 
diversity of species that's all going to contribute to the carbon dynamics of the soil and also those ecosystem services so much of the time like gardening is really kind of demonstrating this reciprocal relationship between the gardener and the soil and you know there's give as well as take there's a balance there next slide now the other service that it's something that natural scientists we often ignore just because we're focused on those first three but social scientists are way better at, at, at this than, than us and they often remind us yeah, but there's cultural services too and these are nonetheless important so an urban horticulture has a link here and so urban horticulture is a medium for our well-being whether it's spiritual aesthetic or recreational gardening offers a sense of being a way of life a connection it could be religious or traditional part of a religious or traditional practice so even if economic value isn't placed on these things it they may be the most important of all at the end of the day and we're learning that quite rapidly during COVID times right <laughs> so, mm -hmm. i'll go next slide so urban gardening is not only has all these ecosystem advantages, but they're all there, but it's also, it also has social and health advantages. So urban gardening actually also provides that opportunity for community engagement, social interaction. It's been shown to increase social cohesion and thereby providing an, an interesting, a kind of safety net, a social safety net and enhancing community resilience and response capacity during times of crises. And, you know, just getting out there and, and into nature and in, in, in doing gardening is, you know, so important for mental health and, and physical fitness um, and just being exposed to it in our daily lives. It actually might lead us to make healthier choices about our diet and, and you know, eat a bit healthier, et cetera. So some of those other, uh, next slide, I think that one's on, yeah. So we, we kind of see, you know, food security ecosystem services but also all this community health benefits as well um, urban horticulture it's uh it can also help to overcome systemic ba barriers that are placed on underrepresented communities areas where there might be food deserts or in other words just the lack of infrastructure in certain neighborhoods in certain areas of cities that have never been invested in to actually support or deliver healthy food to all communities. And so urban horticulture can play a role in overcoming some of those systemic barriers. Um, you know, if the soil is safe and if land is accessible, community gardening can, uh, can be a beacon of light and actually support, um, provide some economic income to, to communities. You know, in order to like achieve zero hunger and eventually improve food security, you know, an inclusive and equitable approach does need to be taken. And so, you know, horticulture may have a, a role to play in uh, not just gardening, but gathering the food and uh, in aspects of food sovereignty as well. So reestablishing that link between people and nature is really essential to that, to conservation of the environment and improvement in people's well-beings. And in theory, kind of connecting people with nature and food will maybe increase willingness and, and, and just increase our understanding uh, and, and willingness to protect the environment as well as move towards resilient food systems. Now, in my day to day, when we were talking about you know community and people and and and, and you know, the social benefits uh, and and just like the people benefits of urban horticulture, in my day to day, I get the opportunity uh, to actually work with a bunch of students who are super passionate about horticulture and who aren't afraid to think outside the box. And I have next slide here. So this is an awesome photo of, of my group of grad students who are just so happy to be working with vegetables in the field this summer with COVID. And you can tell, even though they're all wearing masks and following, following COVID safety protocols, you can tell that there are huge smiles underneath all of those masks. So, you know, there's, and during a pandemic, they're smiling no less. So there's definitely joy in being outside and in, in doing horticulture. Um, you know, when we're thinking about food security and food sustainability and, you know, the role that urban horticulture might have, 
nothing says this better than actually looking at the United, uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And so the United Nations has a series of sustainable development goals. There's 17 of them. And they're goals that are put out so all nations and globally we can eventually move towards sustainability in all ways if these goals are achieved. So they're lofty goals, but they're nonetheless necessary towards achieving sustainability. So if you look at all these 17 goals, it's actually really striking how many urban horticulture links to. You know, it can link to zero hunger and no poverty. It can link to well-being. It can link to uh, gender and reduced inequalities. It can link to directly to sustainable cities. Climate action with those ecosystem services and life on land. Like it can just link to so many of those sustainable development goals. And it's for these reasons, like, you know, all of these reasons and, and the just sheer numerous links that can be made that many cities around the world, actually very large cities, do invest and devote space into, into infrastructure for horticulture uh, directly within the city. So, you know, iconic places, if you think of Singapore or um, uh, Shanghai or Havana, the space that's devoted specifically to horticulture in the city is astounding. And in some of these very large cities, again, they're actually able to support up to 60% of their city's needs for fruits and vegetables, all sourced from within the city. So really remarkable. And I think COVID has given us a chance to reevaluate how important local urban green spaces are to us and, and what we want from our streets, from our pavement, from our, uh, from our parks, you know, and judging by, you know, garden sales this year and, and uh, you know, community garden uptake and, and social media. I think many people have decided they do want more fruits and vegetables and plants in urban spaces. And so there is a real opportunity here for urban planners and developers to kind of consider what might be achieved if we bring farming into urban landscapes. So to close this talk, I'd like to leave you with just a few comments. You know, next time you're sitting down to eat a delicious meal, maybe take some time to think about the common language that food offers us and the potential that, you know, the plants and the food, the plants may have to, nav to help us navigate towards a future of food. And also next time you're walking around town, think about those green spaces and think about the ecosystem services that they're giving us and contemplate, you know, how in the future might we balance what we with food production with with food needs to achieve food security and how urban horticulture or just horticulture might be a part of the way towards a sustainable food future so with that i would be pleased to take questions and actually see some of you thank you kate that was fascinating. I would invite people to put their questions in the chat. And I'm going to take this opportunity while the questions are coming in to ask you a question, because I'm one of these aspirational gardeners. I'm, I'm just delighted with things don't die immediately on me. And, uh, and so even though I have these good intentions, um, there's, there's a lot of land on my property that could be used much better. And I, I've heard whispers that in Regina, they have a, an organization, a community group where they basically just, you, you can allow someone to come and farm on your property. And, and so I, I wonder if you could speak to that. Like, are there, are there some grassroots options that people like me, or maybe people who are skilled gardeners, but would still like to partake could be involved in? Absolutely. And I think, I, I, I believe some of our horticulture graduates have started something like that in Saskatoon. Um, where, where they, they team up with people who have land, access to land or own land or just have places in and about town and uh, they don't mind if they, they you know, come and, and grow, grow a garden there. So there, there's, you know, really, really fantastic entrepreneurial new grads that are, that are thinking that way. And I know the one in Regina has received a, a lot of press. Uh, they've been getting really good, um, uh, getting in articles and stuff like that. They've, they've a lot of good press, and, but there are, there are certainly some upstarts like that in Saskatoon as well. Yeah. Okay, I mean, would you would you happen to know? Like, is it something at some point you could put in the chat? If yeah, I'll have to. I forget the name of the student, so I'll have to do a double check on on when the name of the student. But I can send that 
that to you. Yeah, yeah. you know what? And I can put that on the Facebook page. And so if people okay. are interested, they can just visit the Cafe Sci Facebook page, which is at the head of the chat. And they can get the information there. That's great, thank you. Okay, so I have a question in the chat, so I will read that to you. Um, I am wondering about policies from the provincial or federal government. Manitoba has a policy that supports local production and eating local, Saskatchewan does not. Manitoba has a lot more local consumption than Saskatchewan. Have you thought of how this policy might be shaped? Yeah, um, I, I think that's a great question and you know, I think shaping policy and is, is really important. Um, I, I I don't have any answers for you on that. Um, you know, it's it's going to look different in each region depending on uh, on the people that are there and and, and you know the uptake of, of, of the industry. So um, I think it, it could be something that policy could support in a meaningful way to uh, to improve access. There all there are there's also a lot of um, there's a lot of like uh, groups that do stuff like this in, with without being under policy. Um, I think a, a great example is that Chep Good Food. So they they have all sorts of uh, community gardens that they run and they operate and they supply healthy food to folks all over the city. And and I think you know it might not be you know policy driven, but it's community driven or or grassroots driven. So. Um, I think there's all sorts of different ways that you can kind of work towards that eventual, the, that eventual, the, the eventuality. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's uh, for whoever put that in the chat and for other people who are interested, one thing that may be useful is to reach across to whoever helped catalyze that policy in Manitoba and say, what did you do? <laughs> and yeah. that's what we do it here. What works, what doesn't, and what can we learn from that? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, and Jackie noted too that, I mean, you're very welcome everyone to put your question into the chat for me to read it, but if you'd like to speak for yourself, you can always just add like a tag at the beginning of your chat question saying, I would like to unmute and I can cue you. Um, okay, so the next question is, is there a group in Saskatoon calculating how much land is paid and advocating against an unreasonable amount? I have seen shows on water and this issue in Florida and hoping we don't go down this road. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not aware of any groups that are calculating how much land is is paved, um, and, and even calculating how much horticulture potential there are in cities. I think, especially in Canadian cities, we're actually farther behind um, in some of the European examples that I was giving today, where they have gone much further in calculating and, and quantifying horticultural production within cities uh, across the pond. So Canadian cities, like we've seen lots of really good social science research coming out for, for urban horticulture, but less so on the science side, like in actually putting numbers to the potential, you know, how much green space is there and what is the climate action um, possibilities due to that. So, I mean, we, we're hoping to do this type of work in, in the new near future, looking at getting funding to do some of that. Cause I think it's, it's, it's valid. Yeah, it's a it's an understudied but super uh, uh, potentially really important area. Mm -hmm. And as I said, that reminds me to ask you, and I'm, I'll get to the next question as soon as I ask you this one, which is if if I could suddenly drop a, a packet of cash for science in your lap, what would be the the dream project that you would want to go and do tomorrow with your grad students? <laughs> oh, we do so, yeah, we we do so many. There, it's hard to pick one, um, but I think. It would be really nice to do some urban horticulture work. Um, it would be great to calculate it. We could focus, start with Saskatoon, calculate how much horticulture land is available in the city already without having to convert anything. And then, you know, what's the carbon sequestration potential of that? What's the, how healthy are the soils type of thing? Um, what's, what are some of the soil ecosystem benefits that we could, um, that, that we have just by, by gardening in the city? And you know, Sask Saskatoon is a garden city. Like people, people love to garden here. It's such a, a huge horticultural following that I, th I think there, there is potential. So it would be really cool to do some of, some of that kind of work. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, I hope your grant comes through, like a big grant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next question in the chat is, many of the cities you mentioned are in year round warm regions. Have there been similar studies done in regions that have long winters like we do here? Yeah, and so that's a question that we're thinking about as well. So some of those examples, if you have a nice long growing season, it's going to be much easier to get a higher proportion of your fruits and vegetable production all within the city. Um, but the the intriguing part and the promising part that I see from those studies is the uh, 
potential for controlled environment horticulture year round. And so specifically like creating infrastructure to actually have, you know, greenhouse space and having, you know, controlled year round production of horticulture crops. And, and, and that's for sure doable. I mean, it's just a matter of, of how, how building the infrastructure for that, but, um, but they did include some of that in those other studies and to consider year round production of controlled horticulture uh, in some of those gray spaces. So, so I think that's, that would help with, with that piece. You know, we do have relatively short growing season in, in a cold climate up in, at this latitude here. So that would be absolutely key. 